Good morning, Emmanuel family. Welcome to our time of worship today. This morning's call to worship comes from the book of John, chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Please stand and sing along with us today. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless grace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark but i am not forsaken for by my side my savior he will stay i labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this i hold my shepherd will defend me through the deep this valley will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me no faith i dread i know i am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus now and ever is my plea for the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said, that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete Till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. 
yet not I, but through Christ in me. Jesus, you are the vine. God, pray, we pray you would graft us in, that we would abide in you and bear much fruit by your Holy Spirit. God, yet not through our own will, but through Christ and the power of the resurrection that raised Jesus to life and now dwells in us. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you all. I've missed you the last couple of weeks. To, uh, three weeks ago, my wife had COVID, and then two weeks ago, I had it, and so I think I'm done. Anyway, it's great to be back with you. Super happy to be here. A couple of reminders for us this morning before we turn to our time of teaching. Uh, if you're visiting with us today or joining us online, it's great to have you with us. Uh, please take time to fill out that welcome card that's in front of you. And uh, you can put it in the offering box as you leave. We'd love to know how we can pray for you, how we can encourage you in your journey with Christ. Uh, a couple of uh, announcements, as I said earlier. Um, thank you to all who participated in our 24 hours of prayer this last weekend. I trust that as you took time out of your busy schedule uh, to seek the Lord, that you were refreshed and encouraged. Uh, perhaps the Holy Spirit gave you uh, fresh perspective on uh, how he would have you uh, guide uh, your uh, year ahead. 
Um, youth group is meeting tonight. Uh, you guys are meeting at Raf and Deb Stefano's house. Uh, details of that are on our website. You can look at that. Uh, details there. A uh, quick reminder about uh, this Tuesday night. Uh, this Tuesday night, we're going to be having our annual meeting. Uh, we're very excited what God did uh, in 2021. It's going to be a great time to reflect on all those things. Also, we're going to be taking a look at and discussing and voting on our new budget uh, for this year. So please make a point of coming to that. A Zoom link has been provided, so if you prefer to participate in our annual meeting on Tuesday night on Zoom, you should have that in your mailbox, uh, so that link is available for you. Also, reports uh, are available for you today to pick up, so you can peruse those before the meeting on Tuesday. You can find the reports at both of our entrances uh, as you leave. And then lastly, uh, in two weeks, January 30th at 10 o'clock, we're having one service uh, the search committee is very excited to present to you the candidate that we really believe God would have us seriously uh, consider. Uh, Kyle DeGagney is his name. Uh, he's been a pastor uh, for a number of years presently. He's pastoring a church called Refuge in Rhode Island. Uh, he informed his church last week uh, that he's stepping down and uh, hopefully to join us. Uh, God has done an incredible thing for us and for him as he transitions hopefully here to be with us. But uh, January 30th, 10 o'clock, uh, Kyle and his family will be here with us. He will be leading worship, uh, preaching. Uh, there will be a time of Q&A during lunch. And then afterwards at 1 o'clock, he'll be meeting with the youth group. So if you want to stay for the Q&A and enjoy lunch with us, uh, please sign up for that lunch. Um, there's a sign up in the fellowship hall for that. You can also sign up for that Q&A lunch online. So please consider that. And then uh, lastly, uh, if you are available, uh, continue to uh, prayerfully consider joining us uh, for Wednesday on our prayer time. Uh, every week on Wednesday, we meet online for prayer. And uh, as Jesus said, you know, my Father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Prayer really is the lifeblood of the church. So think about joining us on Wednesday night as well. With that, would you please bow with me in prayer? I'm going to read uh, Psalm 24 for us. And it says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, because he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God as Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Father, we bow, God, before you this morning. And we acknowledge, Lord, that you are the King of glory. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, apart from you, there is no other. And God, we bow before you this morning. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be honored and worshiped and adored, Father, in our fellowship and in our homes, in our families and marriages, in our children, in our offices and places of employment. God, we pray that you would be lifted up as the most important, and worthy of all praise. God, we gather here this morning, God, to refocus, reorient our affections, to confess our sins and to seek your face and perspective on our life. God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins today, that you would continue, Father, to pour out your grace upon us. Thank you that your faithfulness is new every morning. We pray, Father, that you would bond our, heart, our hearts together, that you would encourage us, God, to love and good deeds. We thank you, Father, for what you've done for the church at Emmanuel, God, in calling or 
bringing to us Kyle DeGagney and his family. We ask, Father, that you would continue to show us the path, show us the way. We pray, Father, that uh, our celebration, our time together on the 30th of January would be one of great refreshment and encouragement. We pray that the details would continue to get worked out. We pray, Lord, too, for those that are sick today that cannot be with us. Father, those that have COVID or just are not feeling well, we pray for your hand upon them and your encouragement in their lives, that your word would bless them and encourage them. Help us as a family, God, to reach out and pray with them and encourage them. Lord, there are those who are struggling in their faith. We pray, Father, that you would bolster them and call them to yourself, that you would soothe their doubts and bring to the forefront of their minds, Father, who Jesus Christ really is. We pray, Father, those who are struggling in their bodies. Father, think of Sandy Usla and Donnie Roy and Steve Bodeker and John Steinbuck and Dora Davis and Gerald Nelson and the Corderoni family. God, we pray, Father, that you would encourage and strengthen them and that we as a family, Father, would bless one another as we speak your grace and truth into one another's lives. Father, we worship you today and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bless and encourage and strengthen us as we seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Philippians, the book of Philippians. We continue our study with that. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 20 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. And as you find your places, would you please stand with me uh, in honor of reading God's word. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. And the Apostle Paul says this, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace, guard, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will no way be ashamed. But I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Will you please bow in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for this new day. Thank you, God, for showing yourself to us through your creation, but more importantly, Father, specifically through your word. We ask, God, now that you would reveal to us your grace and power living in us in the resurrection life that Christ has given. Holy Spirit, please be our teacher and guide and comfort, Lord, that we would continue to become who you want us to be, that Christ would be lifted up in our body, soul, and mind. Father, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we started our new series in looking in the book of Philippians. Uh, the series is entitled, The Christian Life. And uh, Paul has written this letter uh, between 59 and 62 A.D. from a prison cell in Rome. And uh, one can retrace how Paul got here in Rome in a prison cell if you read Acts chapter 21 to 28. Paul absolutely wanted to go to Rome to preach, but he probably didn't anticipate getting to Rome by this path. And uh, our section begins this morning by Paul saying, uh, Brothers, I want you to know what's happened to me. I want you to know how I got to this point, what's going on in my life. Well, Paul has been arrested in the temple in Jerusalem because the religious authorities there thought that he had desecrated the temple courts by bringing Gentiles into the temple courts. 
And by the time that Paul had written this and had actually been arrested and brought to Rome, he had endured mob riots. He had been uh, thrown in prison a number of times. He had been shipwrecked. He'd had a lot of personal stress. And I just want to share a little bit of his biography with you uh, as we look at 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is what Paul says. This gives us a background as to what Paul is saying. Uh, brothers, I want you to know what's happened to me. Here's what's happened to him. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, I've been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. For 2 Corinthians 11, 24. Five times received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Typically, if you were whipped 40 times, it would cost you your life. So Paul was on the edge of death multiple times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily pressures with the concerns that I have over all the churches that God has put in my life. Brothers, I want you to know all that I have been through. This is my life. And as we talked about last week, the book of Philippians is perhaps Paul's most affectionate and pastoral and emotional letter. And he says to his brothers and sisters, that family and Philippi, you guys, this is my life. My heart goes out to you. And I'm just, I just want to remind you that, man, I have been on the edge of death multiple times. And as he talked about last week, he said, I long to be with you. And this is what I've been through. And he writes this letter to this church that he established some 10 years previous. And then he writes this letter from a prison cell in Rome some 800 miles away. And he says, you guys, this is where I'm at. Again, you can revisit how this church was planted back in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 40. Last week we considered in our introduction in chapters 1, verses 1 through 11, that the Christian life is a partnership. You guys, I'm so thankful that you and I are partners in this journey of life where Jesus is our center. I'm so thankful that I have you as partners. And you know what else, you guys? Uh, the Christian life, it's confident in God. He who began this good work, he who's calling you, who's wooing you, who's transforming you, we can be confident that he who started this, he's going to finish what he started in you. Last week, we also talked about that the Christian life is affectionate. Paul says, you guys, I'm, I long to be with you. And the Christian life is prayerful. You guys, here's a prayer. I'm going to pray for you. A great script for us to think about, God, how would I pray for my brothers and sisters? Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Great verbiage. God, this is how we ought to pray for one another. Today, this week, our, our focus is central on one specific line. Singular idea this morning. Our big idea is this, that the Christian life puts the gospel first. That's what today is all about. The Christian life puts the gospel first. There's a lot of uh, Christians in the world today that don't put the gospel first. What's the gospel? God loves you. He created the world, everything in it. The problem is man is sinful, broken. We do what we want, when we want, with who we want, where we want, whatever we want. And we're broken, all of us. And hurt people hurt people. But the gospel, God loves us so much that while we're still sinners and broken, Christ died for us. God loves us, we're sinful, we're broken, Jesus dies in our place. When we place our faith in Christ, we are reconciled to our creator, new life starts over, that's the gospel. So a lot of people, a lot of people call themselves Christian, the gospel is not the first thing. It's a lot of other things, a lot of churches, the gospel is not the first thing. But Paul says in this passage, the gospel is the first thing in the Christian life. And Emmanuel, I burn that the gospel will be the first thing. 
But look at verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Everything that's happened to me, the reason it happened to me is so that the gospel would go first. So the gospel would make progress. It's clear throughout the whole palace, God, the reason I'm here, the reason that I'm here, uh, and it's clear to the, to the palace guard and everyone else, I'm here and I, I'm in chains because of Christ. Paul says, I want you to know everything's happened to me, but it's turned out for the good. It's turned out so that the gospel goes forward, so the gospel advances. The challenges that I've endured, the things that have happened to me, it's happened for a reason. Why? So that the love and the grace and the truth, the reality of God in the world, Christ, God with us, that, that message would go forward. That's why all this has happened to me. That's why it's going forward. I was thinking about this word, uh, advance. We all want to advance in something, right? We want our kids to advance in school. We want the stock market to advance. We want our health to advance. We do not want the scale to advance, right? We want to uh, advance at work. We want our reputation to advance. We want our strength, our health to advance. We want our church to advance. We don't want anything to go backwards. We want everything to go forward. We want everything to have success. What does Paul say? Is that everything in my life happens to advance the gospel. My whole life, all of this stuff that I just read in 2 Corinthians and his short biography, everything that's happened to me, the reason it happened to me was for the singular purpose was to advance Jesus. That's why. And the circumstances that Paul endured uh, could have been seen as a blow or a setback. Paul doesn't look at it that way. Instead, he looks at everything that happened in his life as a good thing, and he leveraged it so that Jesus would be more famous. Wearsby suggests that this word advance or furtherance means pioneer advance, pioneer advance. The word actually is a Greek military term referring to the army engineers who go before the troops to open the way into new territory. And instead of Paul finding himself confined as a prisoner, Paul discovered that his circumstances really opened up a new arena of ministry. How easy it would be for us to get frustrated at the challenges at work or home and relationships. Paul doesn't look at it that way. He sees it as an opportunity to open up new arenas or areas of ministry, new areas where the gospel can have more traction. That's how Paul looked at it. And Paul says in verse, thir verse 13, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace garden. Everyone else, the reason I'm here, the reason I'm in chains, it's not because God's mad at me. The reason I'm sitting in this prison cell chained to a guy is that so Jesus would be more famous. So the gospel would go forward. God was using Paul's chains, his difficulties, to advance the message of Jesus into new arenas that have been untouched, to move into a new pioneering field. We can read in Acts chapter 16, before Paul goes to Philippi, he had it in his mind that he was going to go in a particular direction. And the Holy Spirit came along in a prayer and vision and said, Paul, I don't want you to go in that direction. I want you to go in this direction. There's a new field, a new area that I want you to go and open up. What did Paul do? He planted his feet and said, no, I'm not going. I've got my agenda. No. Paul was flexible. He was soft. He said, okay, I'll go in this direction. And because Paul was flexible, he went and he met some women that God had worked in their hearts already, Lydia and her family. He got arrested, thrown into prison. God, what are you doing? No, he was singing praise in the jail. And God had already determined that he was going to cause that jailer and his family to be awakened to the gospel. And because Paul didn't say, God, I'm not going there, but rather, God, I'm flexible. What do you want me to do? He went, he met with Lydia and her family. They believed and baptized. The jailer, his family believed and baptized. And a church was planted, a new area of ministry. Now Paul's in Rome. Now Paul's in a prison cell. 
And he's like, man, I got these chains on. Woe is me. Paul's like, no. The reason I'm in this new place is so that God can open up another new area for the gospel. It's just amazing at, at, at the wondrous things that God would do and can do and has done with people that are flexible. They headed towards Macedonia. They didn't plan on it, but they went. A church was planted. Paul says it's become clear through these chains that I'm here because of Jesus. And I just, I wonder how God desires to use Emmanuel Baptist Church in new arenas of ministry if we continue to grow in our flexibility. We're not talking about doctrine. We're talking about, God, how would you use us in ways that we could never imagine? Paul didn't know that he was going to plant a church in Philippi. Paul didn't know that he was going to minister to people in Rome in a prison. He didn't know. But God's like, I've got something new for you. Listen, go. What would God have to do through Emmanuel Baptist Church if we just went like this? God, what do you want? What do you want? Again, Wiersbe says, God uses Moses' staff. God used Moses' staff. God used Gideon's water pitchers. God used David's sling. God used Paul's chains. How would God use little Hundred person church in zip code zero two zero five six. Second Timothy two eight nine says uh, Paul says remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead descended from David this is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal and Paul says but you know what God's word is not chained God's word's not chained. God has a message to humanity, and his message isn't going to fail. It's not going to peter out. It's not going to get tired. It's not going to get frustrated. It's not going to get blocked by some mask or virus or government's intervention. God's message is not going to be chained because God loves people. God loves you. He loves me. And he sees the reality that our sin has caused a great chasm between himself and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, and the gospel, then the word of God will not be chained. And because of Paul's chains, the gospel is making an impact to those on those who didn't know Christ, the palace guard. They heard about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, but you know what? Verse 14, Paul's chains also made an impact on those who did know Christ. Because of my chains, my brothers and my sisters in Christ are now speaking the word of God even more boldly, fearlessly. They have more courage. They were emboldened to defy possible danger or opposition. They were daring. They were willing to risk safety and convenience for the sake of talking about Christ. And the question that we can all ask ourselves is, am I willing to risk safety, and convenience for Jesus. Paul had set the tempo, the cadence. Now these people were unashamed of the gospel because what they saw in Paul, they, they spoke repeatedly without being afraid of anyone. They just kept talking about Christ. Listen to this. Again, here's another quote from Wearsby. The secret is this. When you have the single mind, when you're single-mindedness, you look at your circumstances as God-given opportunities for the furtherance of the gospel. And you rejoice in what God is about to do. When you, look, when you have single-mindedness, my life's all about this, you begin to understand that what God has put in front of me, that this is his plan. And you begin to think about the opportunity, what is God going to do? You don't uh, start complaining about what God didn't do, Rather, God puts you in this position and you open up your head and your heart and you say, God, you're the one that put me here. What are you going to do? Not, God, what didn't you do? When we have this singleness of mind, 
that everything that has happened to me was for the focus, the, 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 the progress of the gospel. We have that kind of mind. It's exciting. Because when we get up out and get going, and God, what do you got for me today? And we rejoice in what God's about to do instead of complaining about what God didn't do. Paul's number one concern was the, the progress of the gospel. He was a man of single-mindedness. He wasn't concerned about anything else. Everything was a distant second. The gospel was first. The Christian life puts the gospel first. And we ought to be thinking in our own hearts and heads and minds when we get up every morning, God, how would you use me uh, to advance the gospel today? When I talk to people at work, God, how would you have me introduce Jesus and my love for God into this conversation? When I bump into someone at the grocery store, when I talk with my spouse, when I talk with my children, when I, when I bump into opposition and difficulty, God, how do, how do you want to use this situation to bring Jesus to the forefront? Not in a weird way, but just like, if Jesus is your all in all, like how would you speak about him? How would you share him? What has he saved you from? Paul was single-minded, and it's a, I understand that it's, it's, a, it's a moment by moment thing. It's, it's by faith. Being patient with ourselves, being patient with circumstances, being patient with God, but asking, Lord, Lord, how would you have uh, Jesus' life and work really be the most important thing in my life? Look at verse 15. Paul says, you know, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy, out of rivalry. Some preach it out of goodwill. Those guys do so in love. They know that I'm put here for a reason. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing they can stir up more trouble for me because I'm in chain. chains. And, and Paul gives this example of this tension that's going on in the church. In Galatians, uh, Paul uh, rebutted or, or uh, we had hard words about people that were preaching another gospel. That's not the situation here. Paul's not talking about another gospel. There were people that felt competition between Paul and their church, other Christian leaders. And they were trying to cause problems for Paul. They were preaching the gospel. But they're trying to cause problems for Paul. Their motives weren't, weren't right. And then there were others that understood that Paul had been set in place there, or put there. One translation says, appointed. This is a really interesting point here. Uh, the word appointed means that he was specifically put there to contain something. It's a passive or middle verb, meaning that it's something outside of you is acting on you. The same word is used in John chapter 2, verse 6, where Jesus goes to Cana, and he's about to do his first miracle. And there's six stone uh, jars there that contain 20 to 30 gallons of water, and Jesus is about to change the water to wine. But the verse, the verse says this. Uh, now there were six stone water pots set there, set there, for the Jewish custom of purifications containing 20 to 30 gallons each. Just as the water pots were set there to contain the water before Jesus changed into wine, Paul was set there in prison, appointed to contain the gospel. There were those in the palace guard who knew that Paul was set there to contain the gospel. And there were some that understand that Paul was set there and they want to cause him problems. There were others there understood that Paul was set there to advance the gospel. And those that were trying to cause problems for Paul, what was Paul's response? I don't care. I don't care that they're going to cause me problems. That's not what's important to me. If we're all honest, um, none of us really take kindly the when people are hostile towards us, right? We get threatened, we get fearful, we want to protect ourselves or lash back. But Paul says in verse 18, I don't, I don't care that they're hostile towards me. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of Christ being preached, that makes me really, really happy. 
Paul places himself in a distant second. He understands that he's been placed there, set there, appointed as a vessel to contain the gospel, to give out. The most important thing is that he's there, set there to contain the gospel, to move Jesus and the message of Christ forward. Paul says, what does it matter whether people are being hurtful or helpful? What does it matter? The important thing is that Christ is being talked about, that Jesus is being proclaimed, the gospel is getting out there, the gospel is making progress. The important thing is, in every way, in every way, Christ is being preached. Paul is saying that, 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 that the top priority the most important thing is that in every way, Jesus' name and the gospel is getting out there. So a question to think about for all of us. When you think about the phrase, the important thing to me is, what's the important thing to you? Job security. Safety of family. My savings account. My health my appearance, my reputation. The important thing is Paul says the important thing is in every way the gospel is getting out there. That's the important thing. The Christian life puts the gospel first. And we come here on a Sunday morning and perhaps in our MO, mode of operation, our default is, yeah, you're supposed to say that on Sunday morning. That's what Sunday's about, right? That's a Sunday message. But you know what? That's not Monday. That's not reality. But no, that's, that's why it has to be the reality. Tomorrow morning when we get up and we engage with the world, we leave this place in an hour or so. Is the gospel the most important thing? Maybe in our minds under our breath we say, no, you, you don't understand. Life is different out there. And my gentle rebuttal is no, we don't understand. We don't understand. If Christ has not been raised, and the engagement of the gospel in every sphere of life, we are to be pitied above all men. If Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sins, and we are no better off than anyone else out there. So when we come here and we engage with the word of God and think about who Jesus is in the gospel and Paul says the gospel's got to be first in how you live your life, it's got to go farther than, than just this room. How we engage with conflict or challenges at work or at home, how we think about what? The important thing is that the gospel is preached whatever the circumstances Paul says this in verse 19, I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will no way be ashamed but have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether, life by, or by, whether by life or by death. Regardless of all the challenges that come into my life, the imprisonment, being chained, all this will turn out to deliver me. God will set me free. He will deliver me to safety. And he uses the prayers of the people and the Holy Spirit as our guide. Last week, Paul shared with the Philippians his prayer for them in verses 9 through 11. Now they share their prayers. Paul shared his prayer for them. Now they share their prayers for him. And Paul says, it's my earnest expectation and hope that I look forward to a brighter tomorrow. On Friday, <clears throat> I had lunch with a friend of mine. His name is Andre. And he was sharing with me uh, an experience that he had regarding his grandfather. And as I listened to him, my wheels were just spinning. 
Because, like, he's talking about stuff that you guys need to hear in regard to putting Christ in the gospel first. And I said, will you write some of this stuff down so I can share it? He's like, sure. And then I thought, I'll probably mess it up. Will you share with them how what you just said relates to all this? So Andre, will you come share that example with us? Pete, good morning, church. Um, as Pastor Pete mentioned, we had lunch on Friday, and I was just sharing some things that have been going on in my life recently, things that have uh, happened to my family over the last few months, and uh, specifically, uh, I lost both my grandparents over the last few months. So my grandfather, who was uh, 93, just passed away this past October, and then uh, two months later, almost to the day, my grandmother passed away suddenly as well, uh, the beginning of December, and as I... Uh, as you can imagine, our, our family's been, you know, dealing with the sadness and, and the sudden loss of, of losing both of them. It's been difficult for us, but in, in spite of that sadness, I've had some comfort and some encouragement in the fact that they were both such strong believers. And every aspect of their life um, really uh, put forth their faith in Christ. And, and that was very obvious to me during the funerals as people came up to us one after another and shared stories about them. And uh, it was just amazing how, you know, every, again, every aspect of their life, even in their death, pointed uh, to, to Christ and how strong their faith was. And there was one story in particular that I shared with Pastor Pete. Uh, so my grandfather, um, there's a man who, who came forward uh, at the, the day of the funeral to share the story that about 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, the, the church that they attended, they went away, the men went away for a men's retreat. And my grandfather's there, and uh, they break up the men into uh, small groups. And uh, as they're in these small groups, uh, they asked the man, the facilitator asked, he said, if you had 24 hours left to live, what would you do with those 24 hours? And I guess each man kind of went one after another and they started explaining what they would do and they all had kind of heavy answers. Uh, so one man, for example, said, you know, I would, I would gather my, my wife and my children and I would apologize for not being around more. Uh, for critical moments in their life, um, that I prioritized my career and my work so much that I missed out on key things. And then another man, I guess, stepped up and he said, you know, I would want to get right with God and, and maybe confess things that I just haven't confessed yet, you know, deal with sin that's still in my life, and I would want to get right with God before facing death. And then yet another man, also heavy-hearted, said, you know, I, I would call up everyone I know and I would, uh, I would tell them just how much I love them, how much they mean to me, how much I would miss them. And it was that kind of heaviness that was just, you know, consistent from one answer to another. And then it got to my grandfather, and I guess he did a, a 180, apparently, to everyone else. And he said, no, if I knew I only had 24 hours to live, I would jump for joy. Because I would know that in 24 hours, I would be with my Savior in heaven. And that apparently floored everybody <laughs> because it was so different from everyone else and it was just such a genuine answer. And uh, so as you can imagine, um, as his grandson, I heard that the day of the funeral and it was news to me as well. It was the first time I had heard that story and, and it, hit me, it hit me pretty well too. And as I've thought about it now over the last few months, there's, there's three things that really stuck out to me about that answer. Is number one, his faith was real and it was genuine. Um, it would have been easy for him to answer like everybody else. That was obviously the theme going on there. Um, but his joy came forward because it was a genuine faith. And, and number two, he really understood the gospel. He understood God's grace. He understood that because we're forgiven, through the, the work of Christ on the cross, he no longer has to carry that burden. Right? He doesn't have to carry around that guilt and that shame. He left that at the cross. So he could look forward to eternity with confidence and with joy. So he understood the gospel. And the third thing that stuck out to me was that when a, when a genuine faith is lived out and the gospel is truly embraced, you're going to have an impact on other people around you. And, and the, the obvious testimony here was that this man who 30 years later still remembered that answer. And it marked him so much that he wanted to share that the day of the funeral. And so who knows, I guess, the snowball effect that that would have had on him, maybe his you know, the growth of his own faith, the impact he had in his own immediate circle, and so on. Um, 
so as I was preparing to speak this morning, I was reminded of uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, let your light shine forth before men so they may see your good works and glorify your fathers in heaven. So the, the example of my grandfather, my grandmother as well, is, is their light was visible because they put the gospel first. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Andre. The Christian life puts the gospel first. The point of application for all of us this week as we walk into Monday or Thursday or Wednesday or Tuesday, how can I make the gospel first in my life? How can I make the gospel first? in my life. How does the church grow? Answer, by advancing the gospel. The church advances as the gospel advances. Brothers and sisters, the Christian life puts the gospel first. Let me please bow in prayer. Father, thank you, God, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the fresh reminder that it is by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves so that no one can boast. But, God, you have done a great work in each of us that have embraced the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ for the payment of our sins. He was delivered over to death for our sins, but he was raised to life to declare us righteous. Father, in your sight, it is by his wounds we have been healed. So, Lord, I pray, God, that as we walk into our world this afternoon and in the coming week, Lord, that you would gently, patiently, kind, kindly, Lord, continue to show us how to put the gospel first in all circumstances, that the world would know, Father, that you are a gracious and kind shepherd risen from the dead, who will one day be returning to take us home. May we be people of great hope and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior is 
Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. What a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. For the benediction, just a reminder, if you are interested in participating in the lunch Q&A uh, with Kyle and his wife Mandy on January 30th, please sign up for that lunch either online or you can also sign up uh, over in the fellowship hall for that. Please receive this morning's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Brothers and sisters, go knowing that God loves you, that Christ has paid the debt, and that we are free. Seek God this week to make the gospel first. Go in peace. Thanks for coming.